I think we might be rolling now. Thanks everybody for joining the panel on Oscar winning or Oscar nominated filmmakers that who have all been involved somehow at the Woods Hole Film Festival. I think you've screened there. Um, and I'm Kate Davis and I actually co-founded the festival 30 years ago with Judy Laster, but really that's, that was just the beginning. Judy has done the hard work since, since then. Um, we threw three films up on the screen um, a million years ago and it just ballooned out and she's made it the, the big festival that it is. And one that's attracted, you know, filmmakers from the documentary world and fiction world um, uh, from all over. And, and um, it, it's really a unique place. First of all, you're on the water in this little wild town on Cape Cod. Um, and so we have a bunch of amazing uh, filmmakers here today. And maybe I just thought we could start by asking like if you all would go around and, and, and talk about your experience, either if you want to touch base with the, your thoughts on the Woods Hole Film Festival, why you're here today, and, and then we'll get into the whole, you know, discussion around the Oscars and how that maybe impacted your life. Um, and I just want to before I forget, mention that the festival started yesterday and ends on Saturday, August 7th, and you can find information and ticket um, purchase site links um, at woodsholefilmfestival.org. Okay, so Heidi, maybe start with you. Heidi Ewing. Hello. You're yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Heidi Ewing, and I love Woods Hole. Um, I, start, I don't remember the first film that was shown there probably Jesus Camp. I don't know, maybe 2007, I'm not sure. But um, I remember that I was asked to be the um, sort of artist and resident, filmmaker in residence there for a festival. So showed a bunch of my work and um, met a lot of people in town. And I was just super charmed by, you know, uh, like the, the main street sort of community spaces the films were shown at and, um, the opportunity to meet marine biologists and talk to people who, um, you know, had uh, experience in, 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 in marine sciences. And it's such an interesting town, um, like full of like this tiny little body, this tiny little marine town, but with all these Harvard grads and, you know, PhD, um, just Nobel laureates. And it's a really fascinating, interesting place to show a film because um, people just come from backgrounds that are, are unusual, uh, in my opinion. So I've always loved showing my films there. I became uh, in love with the town and I started to um, come every summer, bring my family, bring my sister, and get to know a lot of local people um, because of the festival. So it really is dear to my heart, near and dear to my heart. And um, like I've made friends in the town and I think it's just really a really a special, unique environment. So I'm very happy to be here. Go ahead, Marshall. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I'll just echo what Heidi said. It's a terrific festival, great uh, you know, selections of projects and fun to always see other filmmakers and uh, meet audiences. And um, so, I don't know, but I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here too. Excellent. And uh, Laura? Um, so this is my third festival to participate in, but I've actually never been to the festival physically. Um, the first time we were invited with Inventing Tomorrow, I wasn't able to attend. And, and then last year I was the filmmaker in residence, but it was during COVID. And so I couldn't, I was in residence from this desk, which was very <laughs> strange. And, and now this panel and so um, I just have a fervent wish that I'll be invited back and I'll get to actually be at the festival and walk around Woods Hole and meet, you know, meet everybody in person that I've had this virtual relationship with. But um, I've just really been struck by um, just great programming that's happening there and, um, and also just all the work that happened last year to put the festival online was just, it was incredible what Judy was able to do. So happy to be here virtually yet again. Yeah, you someday got to be 
in town, absolutely. You know, amongst the fishermen and the Nobel Prize winners, it's kind of a crazy mix. And Doug? Yeah, I was, um, my first Woods Hole experience was back, I think it was 2016, I was there with um, a film called Jada and, you know, Heidi did a great job describing kind of the uniqueness of, of, of such an amazing place to have a film festival. And it, you know, having gotten a chance to go to a number, you know, there's a handful that, that stand out in, in having kind of a special quality to it. And Woods Hole is definitely one of those. And we got to come back this, uh, this past year in 2020, um, virtually during the pandemic. And um, so it was still a great festival to be a part of a very different experience that time, but, but was certainly really wonderful to be back. Yeah. Well, um, here we are again. And I guess, you know, I think that the topic of this, you know, about sort of how the Oscars relates in particular to um, independent films, such as yours, I assume all of yours were. Um, I mean, how, maybe I should just open it up and anybody wants to jump in and talk about whether you, starting out as a filmmaker, did you even think about the Oscars? Was that in your mind when you began? I'll say, I, when I made my first feature length film, um, I didn't actually, I don't think I knew that there were Oscars for documentaries. So I, it definitely had never occurred to me before. Um, before that one. Yeah. This, oh yeah, Doug speaking here. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely didn't really think too much about it, including with Feeling Through, which we were in this past Oscars. I, um, it was actually through a very fateful last minute encounter uh, with, with a fellow uh, friend and fellow filmmaker who encouraged me to submit where I was literally uploading the assets with like two hours left before the final deadline because I wasn't initially going to submit. So yeah, it wasn't something that um, was really in my, in my purview or my, in my immediate awareness, but certainly really grateful to have had the experience this past year. And um, now it feels like such a, such an oversight to have not even like considered it prior to this like last minute fateful uh, participation. <laughs> It took Rachel and I, I think, four or five years to make our first film to, from start to finish, The Boys of Baraka, um, which then was like shortlisted for the Academy Award. But I didn't even know about the shortlist either. Like, I didn't know who submitted it. I know I signed some. I honestly was like, what is the short? I didn't even understand. I thought we were nominated. And I, don't want to, I mean, it was just so confusing. <laughs> um, and then for Jesus Camp, we were, we were more aware of it, of course. And once we, um, you know, we found out we were nominated while we were on an airplane and the captain announced it. It's a crazy story. <laughs> but uh, and we got super drunk. We were on our way to Los Angeles um, from New York. But it was really fun and exciting. But the best thing about being nominated for the Oscar for Rachel and myself, um, it was 2007 or something, was that we had no chance of winning because we were up against the inconvenient truth. So there was no pressure at all. And um, we had, I think, more fun than, I mean, Clint Eastwood told us that we were having more fun than anybody in the room. And I think it's true. Like people kept walking up to us like Will Smith. And That's like, just the case with you two anywhere you go, right? Isn't that just kind of like... <laughs> But especially because we're like, we'll never be here again, and we're not winning. I mean, I don't know. It was so freeing. Um, and it was really kind of the best way to be nominated, um, I guess. I mean, for me, it would be knowing that, like, you don't even have to write a speech. And, like, the vice president was sitting right in front of us when he won. I mean, the whole thing was absurd. So, um, yeah, I had no idea it could happen. And then when it happened, we made the most of it. And who knows if it'll happen again. It's like been a bunch of short lists since then. Marshall gets nominated every year. But the rest of us, the rest of us get not, we have to wait for up more years. He's got sort of the lucky charm. But um, I don't know. It, I, we really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I grew up watching the Oscars and just kind of like praying for that day that a woman would be like, would win best directing. And I remember like crying when Catherine Bigelow won, you know, I just had this relationship to it. My first film was a, actually a fiction feature film that I made in 2002. And that 
I didn't think there would be, I mean, there wasn't any chance that that film would, would go down that path. It was a much more kind of experimental, crazy movie. Um, so I didn't have any awareness of it at all. And I actually became more aware of how the whole thing worked only by being in the academy. I didn't really understand like how people voted and I didn't understand that people got lobbied. I didn't, I was like, wait, why are, why am I getting these emails? Why am I being invited to these luncheons and dinners and stuff? I had no clue how it worked until I actually was a member of the academy and then started to kind of understand the landscape of it. And um, when my short walk around Cha Cha went through that process, it was, I kind of, I knew a little bit more about it just from watching other people go through it previously in other, in other years. Yeah. And in some ways, I mean, did it, did it, now that you're sort of, nobody's a virgin here anymore, you know, and we've been to the Oscars, does it, does it affect the way that you think about your upcoming films? How important is, you know, being an Oscar contender for you when you're working on a project? I'll say for me, it's you. I, it's it would be crazy to do anything creatively with the idea of trying to get nominated or to win an Oscar. Like it's such a you know, it's such a chance. is such a huge part of it, and um, and you can't really psych out what people are gonna like. Like I, I definitely don't think about it when I'm working on a film. Same. I, I would. Yeah, I would never. Yeah, these films take so long to make, and your your life is so constructed around the film while you're making it. And the, those are the considerations. It's like, what am I gonna? What's gonna keep me like passionate? Though that's what drives my choice about making a film, not like what might happen. I, I you, you're just gonna die if you're thinking that far down the road. I would. Plus, every year, so many good films don't get nominated, and there's always something on there that you're like, really? Did that one need to be nominated? And you just can't figure it out. So it, 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 it's just an energy suck to, to spend energy thinking about it, I think. Right. It doesn't make your work better, that's for sure. Like, no. it's, just, it's a distraction. This is, this is great to hear from everyone because I'm like, fr I'm, I guess I'm the newbie of the bunch here having come off of this um, past Oscars. Um, and, you know, for me, it was one of those things where there, it was a little bit of, it had an element of a surreal aspect to it because as I described, submitted so late and then it was just such a whirlwind from there. And, you know, there was an extra month or plus of, of campaigning this year because of the pandemic and things getting pushed back. So it was like, I, I got swept up in this kind of whirlwind of a sense where I was just so zeroed in on like, what was the next thing that I needed to do? Like, you know, and figuring out what it, campaigning was in the first place that now, you know, we're August 1st, just a few months removed from the experience, I think has been a nice opportunity to decompress from it, be really grateful for it, but also kind of, uh, put it in perspective and like everyone else was saying kind of on that process of like really not having it be something that's like the goal when making something because that, like like that's not why I got into filmmaking um that's not you know cut to what Laura was just saying about finding something that you're passionate about that you're going to want to stick with and really see through like those are the things that are really important and then the things that just that you think have value the stories that are calling to you that you want to share with other people. So, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm saying now just a few months removed from the experience that that's how I'm going to move forward. But it's nice to hear from some of the more veteran uh, filmmakers here, the, the echoing that. Yeah. And, and I mean, I guess in a way you're all saying it's the icing on the cake. Like if it, you just happen to, you know, Get served dessert, great, but um, it's it's not the it's not the goal, and certainly it's like ironic because so many of us have done films that are, you know have social value, you know, have, have are about justice or, or you know, social issues, and that it it can feel for me anyway. It was almost at odds. I was at the Oscars with my main subject, who you know was a black woman who was beaten up by cops you know and it, there she is in a gown and she and I were very aware that this just like this is kind of a bizarre paradoxical situation that this would be what brought her 
to this sort of fabulous, you know, event. Um, there's a lot of pain that, you know, got her to where she was. Um, and uh, I just want to throw something else in there, Kate, just, just following up on the conversation we're having about how much it matters and, and are, are you going to try to get your next movie to win an Oscar, which of course the answer is no. I would argue that it 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, it was more consequential to someone's career in documentary winning an Oscar being nominated than it is today because there were very few ways to get noticed in documentary film, especially when we started out. Um, there were not, there were no streamers, for example. Um, you know, cable was just starting to do documentary. I'm not making myself sound ancient, but the bottom line there was there was like a lot, PBS was important for funding. There was, you know, ITBS, there was, you know, HBO sometimes, but it was like, um, right now, I think people's, in terms of a career and success, in terms of, you know, getting offers and opportunities, I think it's less important now because documentary has exploded to the point where the people who made Tiger King are going to be busy for the next 15 years and they were definitely never looking for an Oscar. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like, I, I think that it's just, it's exploded in such a way that, the Oscar is, is icing, but I think previously maybe it was more like consequential to your next project or your next projects in documentary than it is now. Um, so I think that, that things have definitely shifted um, for, for professionally in terms of what it means and what it doesn't mean. Right. You're so right about that, Heidi. That's so true. Right? It's different now. Well, I mean, we used to call it the D word, right? You know, that it was, we were such the poor step, step sister or whatever, stepchild. And, and now, as you say, there are documentary series that just get huge amounts of um, attention. So it's not the only way to say, oh, you know, this film is actually worthy. Um, and it used to be sort of embarrassing. So <laughs> to say you were a documentary filmmaker when I started, I mean, really. Um, so yes, I mean, but um, it's still, at the same time is a big game that people play. What do you all feel about how it's changed the documentary landscape? Um, once you're in it, once you decided to campaign and kind of go for it, you have to make a decision. How much time does that take? And is it, what's it like? It's a lot of people here are probably curious. Pro and con. You know. Uh, when t my first film, Street Fight, was nominated, that was right same time Jesus Camp and Boys of Baraka was out, and um, and the rules were different, and so the experience was very different because at that point um, committees picked the short list, so it, it was not open to the entire doc branch to pick the short list, and so there was no lobbying that really happened at all until the short list came out because. You didn't even know who was on the committee and you couldn't really lobby people and it just like nobody did it. And even when the shortlist came out, the lobbying was like, you know, maybe you'd have a screening with snacks or whatever, but like there was not, the amount of money and energy that goes into it today is a hundredfold what it was then. And like the strategy and the, um, or at least that's how it seemed to me. Uh, maybe I was I was clueless, but um, Heidi, you mentioned you guys, uh, when when Street Fight was up, we were up against March of the Penguins. Yeah. And so that was the year. That movie had made more money in the box office than anything up for best picture that year. Yeah. And yeah. it was kind of hilarious because they, um, the guys that made that, they showed up with these huge stuffed penguins to the Oscars and you know, walked the red carpet with their penguins and everybody knew. And I had saved up some money uh, to buy a, a, a quarter page ad in one, in the Hollywood Reporter's documentary edition. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm gonna like make sure that I get the word out about Street Fight. So I had a quarter page ad. And when I finally got it, March of the Penguins had bought the entire cover overlay. It was one of those, was just like, oh Jesus. But at the Oscars, you know, they they uh, they move you down. Like the documentary people are are in the back of the room and sort of the worst seats in the house. So they move you down <coughs> right before the during the commercial break before they call you, so you don't have so far to walk. And um, so I was sitting next to the 
the murder ball guys and the, and the March of the Penguins guys. And, um, and then when March of the Penguins won, they got up and, and had to kind of squeeze past me. And in doing it, they hit me in the head with their, with their stuffed penguins. And one, of, one of my friends that uh, did a, uh, had recorded it and did a screen grab of the point where I'm like this, getting hit in the head with a penguin and s printed it out and framed it. And so that's like in my office right above my desk is this picture of myself going like this as I'm getting hit in the head with a with the penguin, but. You know, that's anyway. a real talk, real talk reminder of like, let's never get too big for our britches. Right. 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 That's easy to. So funny. Well, honestly, what you said about, um, the, uh, you're right, the shortlist is picked by random and then you didn't know. I, I think that it's time to get rid of the shortlist, okay? I mean, it's just like, I think the documentary has graduated to a point where um, it should be treated like the rest of the films out there. And there is no short list for most of them. So I just think people spend a lot more money. I just think it should go right to nomination. I think it would clean everything up a little bit. I'm sure it'll never happen because there's a lot of reasons people argue against it. But um, I just think the spending is out of control. And it also raises people's hopes that have no chance. And they're spending money and they're applying to the Oscar when – if you have not, if you have no commercial success and you haven't been seen at all, you're not going to be nominated. And it's not going to happen. So I feel like there needs to be a reset in the way it's done. Yeah. Any anybody else on on Oscar rules or the experience and that that you know something that really stands out to you as being important to discuss? I mean, I I think that. I, I totally agree that the amount of money that's being spent is like, it's ludicrous. And, um, and, and, and it's not an even playing field, right? Because you've got these incredible films that are, you know, there's like international films that are nominated and they're up against like a film that's coming from Netflix and, you know, Netflix is spending and the other streamers, not just Netflix, I'd say all the streamers it's, it's now like, millions of dollars to run a campaign. And I don't think people understand that. They see this documentary film and I don't think they understand that the budget for the awards is usually much more than it costs to make the actual film itself. And that's like so incredibly backwards. But then if you're up against one of those films, you're up against that budget, you just have no chance. I mean, you just, you can't possibly get near that kind of spending, you know, um, and when you're on this, I, you know, cause I was nominated in 2020. And um, so this was well into the kind of streaming thing happening. And, um, you know, you're on the circuit with everybody and, you know, you're on the same plane going to the same places sometimes. Right. And so like I'd land with like other filmmakers and they're in first class. I'm literally in coach. I get out, they get picked up by a Cadillac Escalade to go into their city where they're staying in a hotel. I am getting on the bus from the airport to get into the city to go sleep in my friend's sofa. Right. Like, so there's a very different experience of like how you do your campaigning and, because of the amount of travel and the amount of work that you have to put into it to go to these places, at least when it was physical, that, that wouldn't be true for Doug, but we had to, you know, you're physically kind of going around to go show it to folks and have conversations with people about your, your, your movie. Um, uh, it's a lot of travel. And so like when you're doing that on a budget, it's pretty harrowing, you know, um, versus doing it another way. So it's a, uh, the amount of money that gets spent on ads, you know, there's some films that we're doing like t a couple years ago, there was a Netflix documentary that ended up winning. It was, the, I don't need to say which one it was. There was TV ads for it. And you're watching, you're seeing that there's like a nationally placed television ad, right? How are the other films who are up against that film feel? Like, you know, huge billboards on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles for these documentaries. It's, it's gotten really wild. I mean, like the amount of money that's spent is, is outsized. I, I, yeah, I hear you. And I was, I think at the Oscars when there were those big billboards um, uh, and, and it's become sort of corporatized in a way. And it's, we were kind of the anti-corporate filmmakers. Um, I mean, so does this mean that you would say to filmmakers out there that if they are interested in one day, maybe, you know, going to the Oscars or trying to get nominated that they absolutely need 
a company like a Netflix behind them? Can you no longer do it as an independent filmmaker or somebody who just gets a theatrical release but has a s small little company? Um, what do people need to even consider this? I mean, didn't um, this year, uh, didn't Collective get nominated, right? Now that was a little film that, um, who in the end ended up acquiring it? Was it Netflix? This is, this, is my, this is my roundabout way of saying, if you make an excellent film, even in Romanian, that just that is an unlikely contender, um, sometimes there's enough buzz at festivals and in the world that a streamer or somebody with money or, or a distributor will take it on and be like, this is an Oscar contender. It might not make any money at the box office or it might not have a huge audience on Netflix or whatever, but we feel it's a prestige film and we're going to get behind it and we're going to promote it. So, so, so little, little films with great import like Collective sometimes can sneak in there. Um, I think there were two movies like that this year. I'm, I'm blanking. Um, but, but it can happen if, if there's enough awards behind it in respect of the film that a bigger player gets involved and, pay, and does that for you. So, I mean, you could still get there if you've got an excellent film, if you don't even, even if you don't start with Apple or start with Netflix or start, you can somehow worm your way into one of those places that will then pay for a campaign for you. It does happen. I, I do agree. There are those exceptions. You know, it's like those when there's a lineup of candidates, there's sometimes it's surprising who, who gets uh, nominated um, without the big name. Um, but it's it's still as the money. I think it's hard to take the money back. You know, I mean, unless we put ceilings or something on, you know, just like uh, in politics, you know, there's discussion of sort of limiting campaign funds and I don't know if that could ever happen with the Oscars because it is traditionally such a glitzy, um, glamorous game. I mean, we've tried. I'm on the executive committee of of the doc branch, as are a few of you, and and it's like it's really um, hard to sort of parcel out how to make it fair. That's really what we try to do all the time um, to keep it democratized to a certain extent. Um, but like we're up against a really new world. It's really changed. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's just like this is this is sort of the thing of that having it both ways. It's like the good news is documentary is a major business. The good news is more people than ever are watching documentaries. There's more money out there for documentaries. Um, it's a very it can be a very lucrative career for people. It's no longer the redheaded stepchild uh, form of filmmaking. Okay, so that's all good stuff. Now, if you're going to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to ride it out. Like we're a real, we're a real business. Then it's really hard to have to carve out different rules for documentary than it is for feature films. There's too much money in all of it. I'm not saying it's not a problem, but like, there's no way the studios and the streamers or anyone will agree to, to pull back on narratives. So like for us to ask them to pull back on documentary, it's almost like saying, um, no, we want to be the little guys. We want to be. Meanwhile, it's just sort of, it's become a big business. So it's sort of like six of one, you know what I mean? It's like, we, we want to be treated. We want to have the budgets. We want to have the respect, but yet we don't want, we want to pull back the spending when it comes to awards. I mean, this is the problem. There's a reason that the spirit awards exist. There's a reason that the Gotham awards exist to, to celebrate independent film because they know that these films have no chance at the Oscars, none. So that's why there's been accommodations made. That's why we have the IDA awards. So I think that the awards within people's own communities are trying to make up for the fact that like pretty much only the big guys make it in narrative and in documentary. I think that's sort of the, the place in the middle. Mm -hmm. Right, and then there's a, there's a big issue over just, you know, whether what categories should get bumped if if there isn't the screen time for it, if the documentary sort of um, is, if we're in the same playing field and there's so many categories, I don't know, makeup artists, what is it? What are some of the more obscure categories? You know, sound effects, um, you know, what, what makes a category legitimate? And we do always have to fight and scramble to really, yeah. really be counted. So I hear what you're saying. Um, do you, do you guys, um, I mean, if you, 
what's your advice in terms of uh, somebody having a, a film, sort of an indie film on their, you know, without a big company like a Netflix behind them, if they really believe in this film, would you encourage them to go to a, to, to get it sold first or just go to festivals and, and, and does sort of theatrical play into this? Um, how would you, what would your advice be for filmmakers who feel like they have a gem on their hands? I mean, I think one thing about this too is it, there has to be a, a, de a delineation between whether or not you have a, a feature length film in contention or a short. And, um, you know, a couple of us here have been, were nominated for shorts. Uh, Marshall, you've been nominated for both. Heidi, I think you're feature length only, right? You're, so it, it's really different for a short because, um, to be quite honest, a lot of people in the academy don't watch shorts. They're so burnt out on everything else that they need to watch. I've had many people admit to me privately, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't even get to the shorts. And so it's much harder to get people to watch your work when you have a short in contention. And so, you know, if you're an independent, you have to be pretty wise, I think, about like how crazy you're going to go on your campaign and where you're going to get the money from for your campaign and, and how you're going to conduct that and how much energy you're going to put into it at all. And, you know, for me, the most important thing was to just, you know, if more people end up seeing the film, great. You know, that seems to be in some ways the most important thing. Being nominated was totally amazing. Um, and I didn't go in thinking that we had a good chance of winning and we did not. Um, but it's, it's really just about like getting more eyeballs on your work. And I think that that's as filmmakers, of course, we want more, the most amount of people possible to be able to see our, our films. And in some ways that's the most valuable part and getting too kind of results oriented about the thing could literally make you insane. And and I saw many people go insane, uh, you know, who were on the circuit with me, who were just like, they were in it to win it. And, and I was like, wow. I mean, like, I, it's not going to, I'm not going to say I didn't try. I did, I did what I thought I could do, you know, showed up, got, you know, set up some screenings, did what I could do. But, you know, we, we didn't have the resources to kind of do something crazy like that. And I also felt like it was really important to just like tailor my expectations daily you know you just had to daily and sometimes you feel crazy you're just like there were days when I'm like why am I putting any energy into this at all like I could be taking this time and making another film I could be like I could be volunteering for something you know I could be doing anything with this time that there is something about it that also feels um a little bit nutty to be investing in um I don't know how other people feel about that it's like it's weird to kind of like put the energy in or not but yeah, I, I would just say that you've, especially if you have a short, you have to just be super reasoned with yourself about what the outcome could possibly be. Yeah, that was that was really well put, Laura. I think you did a great job of kind of talking about um, a holistic kind of view of what that experience looks like. As someone who was in the narrative uh, live action shorts category, um, so I can't speak for docs or features. Um, you know, for us, it was, it was a, again, it was something that was really an afterthought, like I mentioned earlier. And then once I submitted, it was like, cool, let's figure this out. Um, fortunately, I had some people with more expertise um, join our team and help, help really kind of guide the ship initially. But for us, it was really about, you know, we'd already been doing a lot of work around the film um, for quite a while as far as um, using it. Um, in a lot of different spaces um, to raise awareness for the deafblind community, um, who's a part of the film, uh, and uh, deafblind actors starring in the film, and also partnered with Helen Keller National Center to make it. So we've kind of been used to being creative um, with like what we were doing around the film. So really for us, it was like, we knew we weren't gonna have a lot of money, but we kind of already had the ability to be creative. So, you know, we did a lot of, we were also in such a unique period. I, I don't know what it's like to be in a normal um, awards cycle. We were, we did everything during the pandemic virtually. So I'm like really not the person to ask as far as what the normal kind of um, conduct is. But for us, it was about like, how do we, how do we be really creative? How do we do, you know, virtual events? And um, we were really fortunate to just like really organically align with Marley Matlin, who was an amazing 
person to align with because she was so perfectly fit the ethos of what our film was. So obviously her, um, you know, her, her standing in the industry did a, a long way in helping us get a lot more press. And we had, we worked with a really good publicist, which is key. Um, if you're going to really make a go at it. And I think there was a level of intrigue given the fact that, you know, even though we were short, it was, it was a film first to have a deaf blind actor starring in the film. So that was something that we got a lot of press just from a lot of people wanting to cover that as like a human interest story beyond just the film itself. Um, again, it's like super specific to what the content is, what category you're in. Um, but just to speak again from our personal experience, it had a lot to do with being creative, um, using the limited budget we had in a creative way, and also just really generating a lot of organic um, and free press um, through a subject that was what we wanted to be sharing about the film anyway. So it ended up, you know, and Laura, I totally hear what you're saying. There's those days where you're like, you know, I have to look in the mirror and go like, I'm spending like all day, like promoting this film. And like, I could be doing other things, but at the same time, in our case, at least it was something that was directly related to kind of the higher mission of, of um, not necessarily why the film was made, but like how we were sharing the film with the world. So, you know, it was an opportunity to really um, just generate the awareness and create some of the conversations around the film that we were already trying to do on mass. So that was something that worked really um, in our favor. And, you know, ultimately, even in the shorts category, and I think this is something that might be changing as we move forward, but we were competing against very, very deep pockets, which I think is like, feels like a newer thing in that category. Maybe some other people who've been around longer can speak to that. But um, so we kind of were, were fighting that battle too, but ultimately we were just, you know, doing what we could within, within, um, you know, our means and, and, and did a really great job at least generating a lot of press. And, and um, I think, you know, I don't want to say necessarily having a good time doing it, but not having a bad time. It was an interesting time. I don't know if I had as much fun as Heidi did, but um, it was still it was still an amazing experience. It's funny with the live action shorts because my understanding of it and is that unlike um, really unlike the documentary short, the live action short seems to also be a calling card um, to make a narrative. Um, and where it's really doesn't that really doesn't apply, I think in the document you, you don't usually make a doc short in order to get the money to make a doc near. It just doesn't. That's not usually the path. Um, but I know with that's that's been a very um, specific route for many many years to come out with a, a live action short and then use it as your calling card for the studio to adapt it. So maybe that's why that category ends up with a lot of deep pockets behind it because if you look at it, nobody watches live action shorts. There's no home for live action shorts on television, whereas in documentary there are. And so it seems like the real point behind a live action short Oscar win is to be like, bring it to the studio and be like, this is a, a taste of what I can do. Um, if you give me $20 million, I'll make the, the feature length version. I don't know if that's what you're running into, Doug, but that used to be how what the attitude was about the live action short. Well, it, it sounds like it, it's, it's more of a showcase of whether you can direct or not. I mean, you're entirely bringing something from scratch to the screen, whereas in documentaries, we can, you know, a little bit just lean on the subject matter itself to, to you know, be a large part of the force of a film. So in terms of live action shorts, good moment to maybe have you guys talk about how it might have helped you being nominated or winning? Marshall, you have you had yeah. a live action short. I had a live action short, right. Um, and um, I mean, it helped a lot. I was a documentary guy who'd been doing documentaries for 15 years or however many and decided I wanted to see what it was like when you get to tell people what to say and where to stand. and. Um, and wasn't sure that I was going to like it or would be any good at it. And so um, I thought, ah, I should just try making something that's manageable before. I had so many friends that had spent years and years and years and years and years trying to put together a feature and had it fall apart at the last second. And I thought, ah, I could shoot something. I could write it. I could shoot it. I could edit it myself. And and so that's what I did. And um and it turned out I liked it a lot. Um, and 
Um, and then, I mean, it, it, and it won the Oscar that year. And, and since then, uh, I've been sort of focused on fiction stuff. So I have a couple of doc things that I've been kicking around. But, but I, I realized that in the year after the Oscars, I was going to have, you know, five seconds of glitter sprinkled over me so that Hollywood people would take my emails and that that was going to disappear very, very quickly. And, um, and so I thought ah, I should just push it for one more year and see. Um, and, and, you know, it definitely opened doors that were closed to me the day before the Oscars, you know, like what's crazy is I'd made the exact same film. It had been, you know, my agent had sent it around and it was literally the exact same thing that I couldn't get meetings on. And then when it got, won the Oscar, I got meetings. And so that's, that's the advantage of it. And, and, and for docs, you know, there's that, but it's also just getting your work out into the world. And for the, all the money stuff, the lobbying, and I feel like one thing that I try to remember, and I tell people who ask me about the spending of money and, and the energy is like, try to use the Oscars to get your movies into the world. Like try to spend your money, not lobbying, you know, micro targeting voters as much as like when you can um, get that exposure to get normal human beings in the world to hear about your movie and decide to watch it. Um, so, you know, I think if you focus on that, then if you don't get nominated or you don't win, it doesn't matter because you still got, or it matters less because you still, your energy went into getting your thing into the world, which was your original goal in the first place. So sort of like a consolation prize of having spent that money and energy is like, it got more people to hear about it and see it. Right, so it's right. keeping your perspective essentially. Oops, is there a zero? I'm hearing it. Yeah. Um, did it have any, any of the stories of how the Oscars may have affected your future or can you, is it hard to assess that, you know, specifically? I think it's really hard to assess. Um, I got some phone calls that I don't think I would have gotten, you know, I had some, some um, projects that came to me that I don't think I would have had the opportunity to discuss with folks because of that. Um, I actually do think it makes a difference if you win or not. Um, you know, I'd like to believe that it matters enough that you get nominated because I was super, I thought that was a great thing, but I actually think that probably um, winning makes a difference. Um, maybe Marshall, you could say, cause you were nominated a few times before you won. Do you think that there's a difference between winning versus just being nominated in, the, in terms of what happened afterwards? I mean, it's hard to say because the nominations were all in doc. So this was a different world and it was breaking me into a world where I don't know any, like, I know the doc people, I know the commissioning editors, I have friends, we, uh, you know, but fiction, it was like starting over from square one. Like, you know, you're, you're up against 21 year olds who just graduated <laughs> film school and are breaking into the industry. And like, um, so, uh, I mean, it definitely, I got a lot more phone calls after winning than after nominating and before winning. So that makes me think there's something to it, but, um, but it's hard to quantify. I don't know that I can compare it to, to the doc experiences. I, I think it does matter. I'm seeing, I'm seeing that it still matters. I don't know if it, um, we, we, we were nominated for Jesus camp and then, didn't have anything ready to go because we spent too much time campaigning and the time that we spent campaigning was not spent towards coming up with a new kind of film. So we had like this really slow time after the, it was like a really silly thing, but I'm telling you, I just did my first narrative, um, feature length narrative. And, um, I'm telling you that the Oscar nomination is mentioned in every article. Um, it's, uh, it was mentioned by my agents every time I pitched for money. Uh, it seemed to matter. They're like, all right, it's her first feature. It's her first narrative feature, but she, she not got nominated for the Oscar. So somehow it was like, I don't know if it made a difference in me getting my funding, but I think it's like, it was something that was like, 
well, we're taking a risk because she's never done it, but in her own industry, she's really like they gave her the nominate. Like it seemed to help the like people finally open the checkbook and give me the money. I, I swear to God, I think it did. Um, and so I don't really. I think it mattered more, more mostly to getting my first narrative off the ground than in my documentary career. But I could be misremembering because it was so long ago. And like I said, so much has changed since then. It rarely comes up in doc, but it still comes up when. Um, I'm pitching for narrative work. So something something in there uh, gives you an edge. I mean, I can see that. I can imagine that, especially because the Oscar world is so has driven Hollywood, you know, and, and uh, so in the feature world, it's 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 the you know, sort of the currency. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I have found personally that Oscar nominated suddenly becomes part of your name in print. You know, mm -hmm. you're not Fred anymore. You're Oscar nominated Fred. Um, and so it still matters. And yet at the same time, and I'm glad you guys all touched on this in different ways, you know, there's a, there's an arbitrariness to it and a, and a, a big money uh, sort of game behind it. That's only increased that, you know, I hope it doesn't sort of disillusion, you know, people, but it also it should it should be in part, I think, a comfort that that you just don't know how things are going to play out. It's not an even playing field, you know. Much as really we do try to make it so that every film gets considered and looked at by somebody or, or actually a few people, um, and and gems definitely that you know are made sometimes really obscurely um, get noticed, really get noticed and rise to the top. The collective is an excellent example. What a phenomenal film. Um, so, you know, it's, it's no reason for it to make people sort of throw up their hands and not think that they, if they didn't get the Netflix deal, you know, you might as well just crawl under a rock or, you know. I mean, I would throw out there, I would throw out there Moonlight. I, I mean, Moonlight? He, there was no world in which Barry thought that he was making a film that he was going to win the. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 a movie about a gay young man. It, it takes place in Florida with not very many famous actors, African American cast. That was absolutely never pegged as the movie that was going to win the Oscar, and it did, and it did, and and and, and it's and it beat La La Land, and it's it'll be a classic, and it's. It talk about beating the odds. I mean, I don't even. It didn't even make that much at the box office, but it was so excellent. It was so excellent that. So I feel like you know, it, it, there are the always the example, and I think that those examples are what keep people dreaming. And maybe that's okay. You know what I mean? Because you can point to these examples. They're few and far between, but sometimes the system doesn't always win. And I think that that is is can be make an illusion, but it also can be someone's motivation. You know, and, and to talk about like, just again, from my, my perspective of someone who's still like just a few months removed from the experience, but I think one of the coolest things was getting during the process. A lot of people saw the film and then there were people in the industry reaching out to me who were like, you know, it was like kind of like finding your tribe a little bit. People who like the kind of film that I made and wanted to talk to me, you know, and get to know me and know what else I was working on and want wanting to start some relationship as far as like, hey, we're interested in what you do. We like what you do. And I think that's, again, like when talking about, sure, it's easy to get caught up in all the stuff that's happening and, you know, whether you win or you don't or all those things. But I think one of the really cool things is, getting to um, really kind of find your tribe in the industry. And, you know, like Marshall was saying before, have obviously doors open that weren't necessarily there before. But I think even cooler than that was just having people just cold email me from like, you know, studios or people that I admired in the industry saying, hey, I saw your short, I really loved it. And like, I want to talk to you. I, and, and, and having relationships that w wouldn't have been there otherwise. So that was something that was just, I think, really kind of a, a larger takeaway in many ways than than all the other stuff, which was really cool. But like, um, you know, it has its moment and then it's done and then you, you move forward. But like those relationships are just really even just hearing 
from people that I, from places that I admired saying, you know, they like what I do and that they, it's like in alignment with what they're trying to do. That in and of itself was, was a really special. Do, do the narrative shorts also go on tour, all the nominated shorts, the way that the doc shorts do? Is there a distribution part of this for anybody? Did that help you? Yeah, they do do the like shorts TV. I think it's called does the animated shorts, doc shorts and, and, and live action shorts. And they have them all in theaters and then they do, you know, pay-per-view or whatever and other, other ways of seeing it. So, um, so, you know, and that, and, and I just put mine on YouTube also. I just kind of wanted people to see it. There's no way that it was going to make money and, and, and it's cool. Like, 10 million people have watched this thing that I made and, and the comments are really sweet and fun. And like, uh, so, uh, you know, again, the, particularly the narrative shorts, like there's no financial upside to it. It's like writing a poem and putting it out in the universe and hoping people like it. I think that's, that's well put. Yeah. Um, are there any stories any of you would want to tell that really stick in your mind as being kind of incredible, getting to the fun stuff besides the whole sort of lofty goals, which we all have, which really is to get our films out um, and impact people, tell stories that open people's minds and hearts. Um, but also um, there's the crazy Hollywood glitz and glamor. Do it, did you guys have any specific moments that really stick in your mind? I mean, the loser's bar. <laughs> the loser's bar was so much fun and we were told about i'm telling you like clint eastwood was our like spirit animal that year he was like you got it. okay ladies you need to know this he's like the loser's bar is where it's at he's like once you lose because we're like we're totally gonna lose he's like no you're not we're like rub against the inconvenience he's oh you're totally gonna lose you go, okay so once you lose he's like the cool thing to do is to never go back he's like you leave and you go to the loser's bar and all kinds of interesting people show up there. And, um, but there've been all these things. I don't know if it was Willem Dafoe, but someone got really, really drunk and outrageous. In the loser. So you had to bring and pay cash money at the loser's bar. Well, the year I was there, there was like, it wasn't like on the house anymore. So um, I remember like we went to the loser's bar after, but we didn't have, we weren't cool enough to never go back, you know, <laughs> like we wanted to, but it was, really really fun like you really got to look like a look at a lot of people um you know like larry david looking like larry david and i don't know just like all kinds of people from movies and stuff that you saw um chilling with each other that was like a really fun weird hollywood moment i think you know that was a good tip because that was really where where the action was <laughs> something that was really cool for us was um you know, Robert Tarango, who was our actor's deaf blind, got to, to go with us. And um, I think leading up to that, um, you know, the Academy was really great about getting on a lot of Zooms with us to like talk through accommodations. And then to have him just, he was so excited about this whole experience. I mean, quick backstory on him, first time actor um, in his mid fifties, he'd always wanted to be an actor, didn't think it was possible given what, you know, he'd never seen anyone like him on the screen had this opportunity to be in our film and people loved him. And he, so the whole thing was just like an absolute dream for him. And, um, you know, getting to tell him that he, he was going to come with us and then the whole lead up and excitement for him for a number of weeks and then actually being able to physically be there with him um, was, was definitely the thing that stands out the most. And, um, you know, we were fortunate to be part of kind of a, a mini uh, disability in film group this past year with Crip Camp and um, Sound of Metal. Um, but it, it was, that was just super special. And I think that's kind of like Harkins. It's easy to get kind of, you know, I think someone had mentioned earlier about being a kid or being younger and watching the Oscars having a certain relationship to it. And I, you know, I kind of can remember vaguely what it was like to have a very different conception of what that is and um and then you know you're in the industry and you have a very different relationship to it and then you find yourself there and you have a very different relationship to it and kind of like to come at it through a little bit more of like 
you know, for lack of a better word, heavy quotation marks, like pure and fun approach of just, you know, Robert's wanting to show up there and see as many movie stars as he can. And like, wants to like, hopes they have good food and like, just there to party. Um, like that, that made it a lot more fun. And, um, and also again, just to have it be, you know, someone who, you know, not a lot of people get to see, like be present at, at a very, very um, high uh, profile, lots of people watching kind of event was just a really, really special, cool thing that, that stood out for us. Um, I, I just remember being really nervous until we got through it, you know, and, and I'm, Marshall was saying how they, or Heidi was that they move you up. So you're seated in the back of the theater. And then when it's time for your category to be announced, they move you up to the front so that you can go up there. And, um, uh, you know, I attended with the subjects of my film, Paul and Millie Gao, um, they're Chinese Vietnamese, they're live in Los Angeles near me in San Gabriel Valley. And, you know, it was the biggest joy to be able to attend with them. And it was like, uh, it was a huge deal for all of us. And they were just like totally starstruck and they had no problem going up to any movie star and asking for a selfie. And I would just never do that. I was like appalled, but they were just like, they just, they had pictures, they had selfies with like everybody. They were like, here I am with Brad Pitt. Here I am with, I mean, they just, they were totally bananas. And, um, that was cool to kind of watch them do that, even though I could not. And I just remember after we lost, walking to the losers bar, and mm-hmm. um, and and I was walking next to like I was walking out, and I was walking next to Margot Robbie who had just lost. And you know I was you know I was I didn't think we would win, but of course you you're a little sad that you lost, right? And I was looking at her, and she was sad that she lost, and I was like. Marco Robbie lost too. Okay. Like I'm standing next to this like gorgeous movie star. She lost. And then you get to the losers bar and my friend Jeff Groth, who edited my first film, my fiction feature, he was nominated for editing the Joker. And and you know, he lost. And and that was when it was fun. It was just like I finally started to relax. I wasn't like trying to like you know, play the what I would say on stage, like just in case it happens. I didn't have that. So I just finally had fun and was able to just like hang out and have a really good time. And um, that was when the evening began in some ways because I was just out of my head beforehand. Um, I the, the one thing that I think is the most fun part of the whole process is the lunch, which a lot of people don't know about until they go through it. But, you know, a week or a couple of weeks before the Oscars, they have this nominees luncheon and, and it's kind of cool because they mix everybody up together and sit them at tables. So the documentary short category is sitting with actors and feature directors and everybody's kind of mashed up together. Um, and it is the one place in the whole process where, and they're very explicit about this, where you are all nominees. And so everybody just treat each other like your nominees. At the Oscars themselves, the hierarchies will snap to, and very clearly, uh, we documentary folks and we, you know, narrative short or documentary short folks will be at the very bottom of the pecking order, and the movie stars and the those people will be at the top. But at the lunch, it's really fun because everybody's there just to have fun. There's no press. That there's nobody to lobby. There's no hustle, and it's just um, it's just people who are hanging out together and talking to each other. And um, so that, that's, that's always been my, my favorite part of the process. That was a great event. I get sit down and Eddie Murphy is my seatmate. Ah, nice. <laughs> he was like, he wouldn't touch the sushi because he didn't see it brought, made and brought to the table. He's like, I do not know how long it's been there. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I heard you're a germaphobe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true. That's a great event because there is an equalizing moment there where everyone's just excited and giddy and there's nobody to impress. So that's yeah. that was very memorable. I totally agree. And then there's the, the at the end of the lunch that everybody poses for a photo, right? right. And we're all one big family. And there's the no class photo, right? Yeah. No, the class photo. And I was next to Spielberg, right? Same thing. I'm like, wow, we're both directors. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, same height, you know. And so, you know, maybe that's a good note to. I mean, if we're at an hour plus, maybe open it up to people, but but say that weirdly enough, once 
you know, I think we've all experienced this a little bit. There are moments of real equal equalizing, you know, that, that when you're at the Oscars, Oscars, there's, despite all the categories and the, you know, did you win? Did you lose? Um, there is also a camaraderie and a feeling of being part of a much larger global film community. That's really lovely. Um, if you can kind of screen out, you know, some of the anxiety around it and really remember to have a great time and how lucky to be there in the first place. Um, so are we, John, we're, going to ask people, I think, who are maybe interested in asking questions if they want to jump in. Anybody? Or raise your hand. Maybe not. I think I saw a hand get raised there, but oh, okay. I don't know how to control this. <laughs> it looks like Kevin has a question. Kevin, there. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes, working on it. One second. We can hear you if you want to ask it verbally. Oh, oh I didn't know you could. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> well, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Great program. So I just am wondering, how does it even work? I mean, you well, sort of touched on it earlier. So you do a film, you're at Woods Hole, and let's say you're silly or just stupid enough to think that maybe you'd like to win one of those. And you say, yeah, how do I, how does that work? There's a lot of rules and, and ways you have, you have to play in a certain amount of cities for a certain amount of weeks in the theater. Um, you can't be on television. Well, they changed the rules since the pandemic, actually. There used to be rules where you couldn't have already been broadcast on television before a certain date. Everything's in flux now because of the pandemic. A lot of things were able to qualify for the Oscar that, that weren't before. So there, I used to have an answer for that, but right now <laughs> it's a bit of like a, a crazy moment where a lot of things can qualify. I don't know if they're going to go back to the old ways or not, uh, or uh, once this, this pandemic sort of recedes, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, you, have to, you have to qualify, like Heidi said, and qualifying means that you have to play in a theater for a certain length of time, and there's different rules for the shorts than for the feature length docs, at least. And, um, and then, you know, uh, the members of the Academy vote for the shortlist, at least in our category, in the doc in the documentary branch. And it's only the documentary branch that votes on what makes it to the shortlist. And then and there's like, I think, what is it, 10, 15 films on the shortlist. And then um, from the shortlist, the nominations are voted on again, only by the documentary branch. And then after that, it goes to the general Academy. And that's really when it gets crazy because everybody's voting on your film, not just documentary filmmakers. I don't know actually who votes on the live action shorts, but maybe you guys could speak to that. So, do you want to say? Well, yeah, um, I mean, I know that uh, initially um, there are, uh, well, there's a lot of shorts that qualify. So there's different um, people within the shorts branch that are assigned to watch a certain group of films so you know that in that initial round there are people that are assigned to watch and rate your film and then um you know i think of our year there were like 180 or somewhere like a little under 200 films that qualify that were you know qualified and submitted and then those get whittled down a, a short list of, of uh 10 um and it, it's just the 10 that received the highest overall scores um, and then from that point, those 10 films, there's the, the shorts branches um, voting alongside the animation branch. So then in that next round, from the 10 to the five that become nominees, um, the, the entire shorts and animation branch uh, votes for the five. And then when you've become a nominee in any category is when the entire academy, all, all branches vote um uh on uh, you know for their whatever whatever their pick is for each category um so that's just what that that looks like as far as from the shorts perspective but the uh, every branch 
puts on the website, on the Academy's website, what their rules are for that year. So anybody that wants to can go and look up what are the rules for that year, and it'll tell you how to apply and how to, what, 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 how to qualify a film. Right. I was going to jump in and say just that, Marshall, that unless this sounds sort of like there's a secret society you have to, to sort of by osmosis figure out in terms of the rules, just look at the AMPAS website and then look at eligibility for films. And make sure you get this year because they change it every year or often. Any other questions? Raised hands? Don't be shy. Something? Okay. What does it say? Congrats. Well. <laughs> Well, you guys we have a question um, in the Q&A from Xavier. Did you find any new filmmaking collaborators through your Oscar campaign, and if so, how? I do. No, I, I didn't. But you do get to know. It's kind of fun. You, you, there's a little bonding that happens between the filmmaking teams um, they get nominated because you start seeing each other at, at events and doing press together and screenings and things like that. So there's, there is a nice camaraderie that, that, that grows up, um, from, from that shared experience. Yeah. You've kind of been through the war together. So. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Maybe, John, what do you think? Uh, you can continue. If, if anybody has any other questions, you can type them in. Um, but if you want to start winding things down. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we can do that. Is there anything you guys all want to add to, you know, what this business, the Oscar business means to you in the grand scheme of things as you move forward in life? Was it a, was it a blip? Was it, is it part of your identity? Is it something you're glad you did, uh, but might never want to do again? Um, I, I'd like to just something that's very Woods Hole centric in this, in this case, um, you know, with, with feeling through this past year, I think uh, Woods Hole is the first festival that we won um, during our Oscar or during our just festival run prior to the Oscars. And, you know, just again, as far as from a shorts per, live action shorts perspective, um, film festivals really do still play a really significant role um, in just kind of gaining momentum for a film. And, and I think kind of just from a filmmaker's perspective, starting to get a sense of, you know, is this, is this like competitive in any space? So, you know, is this something that people are, that's rising to the top in any setting. Um, and it was just really cool for us because, you know, Woods Hole, which was a festival that I had gotten to go to some years prior, I think was the first um, win that we got along our festival run. So, you know, thank you to, to Woods Hole specifically for kind of kicking things off for us um, this past year. And, and um, you know, just a thank you to, to festivals that really do still play a large role, um, at least from the, the live action short standpoint. Um, they're so really, really important in, in kind of the overall um, scheme. That's so true, Doug. It, thanks for mentioning that. And, um, you know, in the, at least in the documentary branch, I don't know how it works with um, what's happening in fiction, but there, if you win certain festivals, you automatically are eligible. You, you qualify for, for Oscar submission. And there's a whole list of festivals that if you, if you win one of those festivals, you, you don't have to play theatrically, which I think is great. And I actually wish there was more of that. I, I wish that there's that list um, had even more weight because that means that the films um, have been curated by like, you know, programming staff all over the world. And um, I think that is a really, um, I think it's a really positive variable in, in the whole scheme of things. That's a really good point. So there are many, many ways to launch your film and one can build onto, you know, 
it can just be a step to another. Um, how about finding networking, finding agents, somebody asks about. Um, how can festivals help help your film in, in ways that are maybe easier than uh, even the Oscars where you're sort of on a driven campaign um, and might not be able to network so easily? I think they, I saw that agent question in the Q&A. Um, my experience is that um, your agents aren't going to look. It's a chicken and egg problem thing. You just you're not going to get an agent until you've you've um, put out a body of work or put out a, an excellent piece of work. Um, you know, most agents don't sign you on an idea or on I might make a film when I'm in the middle of making a film unless you have like an insanely awesome rough cut. You're able to get it to a, an agent. Um, I also don't think that it's like that crucial to get. An, you don't want an agent that you're like the lowest man on the total pull for anyway. You'd rather get an agent once you have put out something and you know where you're going with your career. I, I just think that people put a lot of um, weight on agents. And in documentary, like almost all the work that Rachel and I have generated, we generated ourselves. Uh, the agent didn't bring it to us, although the agent does bring us work and stuff, but usually we don't, that's not, our, it, it's just, I think it's, I think there's too much weight placed on the importance of an agent um, uh, when someone's very, very early in their career. Get your film done, find a way to get it done, make it unusual, make it sort of um, your own, and then the agents will come, and then you can share all your money with that person later. So I think it's, it's not something that should be so uh, sought after. It's not going to change your career because people are going to want to see the work you've done. Even if you have a fancy agent, they're going to be like, great, what has she done? So I, I don't, I think the agent chasing thing shouldn't be a priority. My opinion, I, you, you guys might have other opinions on this. I agree. Totally agree. The nice thing about film festivals, about making films, is this film festival thing, which doesn't exist for most other art forms. Like, if you're a sculptor or you're a poet toiling away in obscurity, you can't just submit it to like the Sundance of sculpture and, and, and have somebody say, oh, this is a great piece of sculpture. We're gonna share it with the most important distributors of sculpture in the world. Like, but it does work, like movies actually do work that way. And that's how I did it. I know that's how Heidi did it and like, I you can make something every year, Sundance and Toronto and Woods Hole and everywhere else. Like there are some slots that get taken by the usual suspects, but every year they break a new filmmaker who's never been heard of, who's just made their first thing toiling away in obscurity and that thing blows up. And that is really, we're lucky to be in an industry that has that. And, and honestly, the Oscars aren't, again, like a pure meritocracy by any stretch. Money matters, distributors matter, all that stuff matters. But most years there's somebody on that list that is a first time filmmaker. Uh, and, uh, and so it is exciting time to be able to make movies. The equipment is so cheap, editing equipment is cheap, cameras are cheap. Like you can make stuff and get it out into the world in ways that were never possible five, 10, 20 years ago and aren't possible in other in other media forms. So um, I don't know, I, I feel like we've beaten up on the process a little bit, which it deserves, but also it's kind of wonderful too. I do agree that it's more democratic in a lot of ways. And um, I mean, in different ways, you've all been saying like, put the put your work first. Um, and you know, I keep, when I used to teach, that's what I said to, to, to students because they're, everybody's nervous. It's a big, you know, competitive world out there. But you know, if you let your heart guide and your vision, you are excited about a film, that's what's going to drive the film, and that's what's going to get people interested. So it's hard. I still, to this day, have to put my blinders on and say, "Don't judge like my own work. Like just make it." <laughs> you know. We'll do the judging later, but you know. It's about the body of work. It's about putting a body of work into the world. It's about putting your head down 
and doing the work and toiling it and it might take years and it ain't glamorous and when you stick your head up and you've got something you're proud of it's true you look around and there's like an audience for it and people there's laugh like, at it and they cry and they and feel it yeah contents, and there's people emailing you and there's there's people seeing it in other countries and it's the most amazing thing in the world but the doing of it dirty it's lonely it's it's toiling and that's it's just do the work so it's like these bursts of like ex, you know extroverted experiences and showing your work and talking about your work and, and then there's many many years of going down and making it so it's like this weird opening and closing of a flower and the festivals and the oscars are part of that a part of that opening and it is wonderful when it happens i think that's a good note to end on is everybody Anybody want to add anything? Are we good? Are we ignoring any questions or we're good? Thank you. Thank you for moderating. It's, it's really so good fun. to see everybody. Thank you, Kay. Thanks, Woodhull, for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.